I'm glad to see that nobody blew away this morning. Between the snow and the freezing rain and every Sunday for the last five weeks, we've had some kind of inclement weather. Literally, a flock of geese was trying to just get across 7th Street this morning, and I was watching them get separated and mixed and thrown around, and they were squawking like crazy. So I'm just grateful we're here today. And you know what? Before I get started, just sitting here with Brian in this journey that we've been on, I just want to praise God this morning. I want to praise God for you guys. I want to praise God for God being on the move, and I just want to, I just want to give God some glory for a minute. So let's amen to that one, huh? All right, now we're going to take a journey and it's a little bit of a condensed journey. If you go to our website and you got some time this afternoon, look at our church history because it's so much more in depth than about what we're going to talk about here in a minute. But we're going to run through this slideshow here pretty quickly. And I just want you to, to look at all the places of God's movement. <clears throat> we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Knowing funds were tight, the Christian co-workers, formed by a group of dedicated women in 1884, found ways to earn money to pay for the building and its upkeep. They'd meet weekly to quilt, serve meals to the teachers next door at the grade school, and work together with other community churches to hold an annual chicken dinner. Meals were also sold to the local miners and other local workers to bring in whatever money they could. Their dedication to helping the church was instrumental in keeping the church going. Past member Ernie Knox recalled that even though they did have a baptistry, he had to pump water out of the cistern to fill the baptistry for his own baptism in 1909. And a fire was lit in a small heater so that the water would be warm enough for an evening baptism. Now that man was eager to be saved, wasn't he? He pumped his own water, lit the fire, and waited till that night. Back in the early years of the church, besides having to pump their own water to fill the baptistry, Church families would also volunteer for janitor duty for a month at a time. Besides the typical duties of janitor, this assignment also included furnace duty, meaning if it was your month, you'd need to head to the church at 3.30 a.m., build the fire, and return every hour to stoke the furnace so the building would be warm enough for worship service. Now we press a little dial, we turn it up, and it takes care of it for us. As you can see, the early years of the Riverton Christian Church were not easy. But thanks to the dedication and determination of those who came before us, we now had a beautiful building in which to worship. After thoughtful prayer and consideration, a committee was formed in 1965 to look at the options available for a new building. Finally, land was purchased at the corner of 7th Street and Powell here in Riverton. Once again, after the work of many dedicated people, groundbreaking for our present day church happened October 23rd, 1966. Member Sue Tisdale remembered her first time worshiping in the new building, saying it was awesome. No time for standing still, the church continued to grow. The ladies in the church began volunteering at the Christian Nursing Home in Lincoln, Illinois around 1971. Several Timothys were sent out into the mission field during this time, and giving to missions was increased as well. In 1974, a choir was formed by Mrs. Wendell Turley, and by the year 1976, the church attendance set a record of 326. In talking to some, we've had an Easter service with as much as 400. The women's quilting group who had worked so hard raising funds for the old church, by the time they had moved to the new building, its members were growing old, and so eventually the group was no more. Pauline O would be in charge of cooking at our church, and it was affectionately known as Bean Supper. Yum, right? Bean Supper? Sarge also recalls he and longtime member of the past, Bob Griffin, had their own men's ministry called Share. Sharing hearts at Riverton are eager where they would help others in the church family with projects that might not be able to do it on their own. Not only were children's Bible classes bursting at the seams, the adult classes were as well. The Christian workers, the friendship class, and the ambassadors class were just a few of the adult classes who would meet weekly for Sunday school. Karen Davis recalls when her husband Norm led a class 
they met in the old kitchen. Every chair around the table was filled so people would sit up on the counters filling those as well. You can amen to that one too. Amen. As the church membership continued to grow, space became a concern once again. So the leadership began to pray about the best way to meet the needs of our growing family. After much discussion and prayer, it was decided we'd build a family life center. At last, the day had finally arrived. On Palm Sunday, March 28, 1999, the congregation celebrated communion for the first time in the Family Life Center. How many of you were here and remember that day? A few of you. Linda Lewis recalled the day very clearly. After the worship service, the choir proceeded out of the sanctuary and created a pathway from the sanctuary to the brand new Family Life Center. As the choir sang, children who had been placed between the choir members waved palm fronds as the congregation made their way into the new building. As you can see, nothing in the church just happened. Behind every decision, every detail, someone or many have prayed and dedicated much love and effort into creating this beautiful building we call our home. Before leaving today, take a few minutes to stop and really look at the many ways the Lord has blessed us over the years. Give thanks for His grace and pray He continues to bless us as we continue to bring more people to the Lord. It's nice to stop and reflect and see where we've been every now and then, isn't it? Especially for those who may not know. Pardon me, this is going to drive me nuts if I don't fix it. I'm, a, I'm sorry. When I tucked my shirt in, I made it too tight, so I was kind of almost pulling myself down. All right, now we're back on track. So here's what I want to talk about right now, my early experience. I first started this church with my wife approximately four years ago. We had just finished going through a rough patch in our lives, and we decided to settle down here in Riverton. I had experienced some very difficult heartache in my ministry. I told God that I had no intention of getting involved in leadership capacity and I wanted to nestle my way down into the pew and just come in and worship on Sunday mornings. Now I assume God had one of those belly laughs. laughs. You mean to tell me? You think you're going to tell me what you're going to do? Needless to say, it did not take very long before I was a deacon and then I was tracking attendance and focusing on new guests. But I remember one Sunday morning vividly. I sat alone out in the Family Life Center between services during the Sunday school hour. There was this overwhelming sense of emptiness in that large space that I couldn't shake. Attendance had been declining and church functions were abysmal. I remember thinking that this huge addition was created to be used, but now it really only sees use on Sundays and the occasional birthday party. So I was burdened with this question of how did we get here? Not long after this, I sat in a second service with 13 people in attendance. Again, that nagging question arose, how did we get here? Then I began to feel the same burden every time I drove past the church. We had this large property with what I assume is the biggest church in town, or if not, very close. We have this large parking lot outside, and we have this wonderful addition with a commercial kitchen and a full basketball court. But on the inside, our sanctuary had 13 people in a single service. Now granted, it typically ran about 30 or so, and if those from the first service were taken into account, there was 50 there, we did have 80 wonderful people. But, this is a far cry from the 1976 total of 326. Where had the overflowing Sunday school classes gone? The overflowing number of eager volunteers who dedicated much of their time and effort to the church, as we just read about. Now again, to be fair, there was a tiny remnant of people holding on. A tiny remnant of dedicated people still serving. And I'm not trying to discredit a thing that you guys were a part of. But where was that vibrant community? 
who saw our very own church building, then those who saw a new church building, and then finally even those that made the addition happen. What happened to our movement of growth? If you turn with me to Revelation chapter 3, we're going to be in verses 14 through 21, and I do want to encourage you to get out your Bibles because we're going to look at a few things that aren't up on the screen after I read through it. Revelation 3, verses 14 through 21 is going to be our main scripture text this morning. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To whom overcomes, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 15, if you look back, I know your deeds that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. It says, I know your deeds. You see, what we do is very important as a church. We are the body of Christ set aside for good works because of the salvation we have received and the price that was paid for it. Our deeds are very important. People have told me, I only need to look forward, but for a moment, for a very brief moment, we need to understand the whole picture of how we got here. The early and middle history of the church was rich in deeds, vibrant in faith, and God blessed it with what we get to see all around us. But for no individual blame on anyone, our latter years have not been the same. An era of emptiness has whittled this place down to a remnant Now, for those of you who think, here we go again, another condemning message from Nick. Let's look at verse 15. Breathe with me for a second. We got that out of the way. Now let's look forward. It starts off sounding really bad. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Sudden flashes of eternal damnation come in. And they flood our minds, separation from God, the outstretched hand reaching for him and can't quite get there. But upon a closer look, it says, about to spit you out of my mouth. About. About is a word of hope. Look at verses 19 through 22. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We all go astray at times, don't we? We all falter because of sin's presence in our life. That's nothing new. But repentance is always available for us to be made right with God. Repentance is always available for us to be made right with God if all we do is ask. Our church had simply lost our way. We lost our powerful servant hearts. God spreads the gospel from person to person through what we do. Like verse 15, I know your deeds. Now, if I'm being honest for a moment, this has been my first 
paid ministry position, I had and still have a lot to learn. You can say amen to that. It's okay. Amen. Praise the Lord. He's being honest. But I have a lot to learn on how to lead people to action. And our leadership team has been seeking God's direction since Brian and I started. We knew that certain parts of our church had been isolated from the rest and that we needed to do something about it. But there was only one problem. We wanted to reach into the community. We wanted to engage the congregation and call us back to action. We wanted to teach our children and youth and on Sunday mornings what it means to be a servant of God and promote our mission work so you all fall back in love with what God is doing outside the walls or even abroad. But we needed a plan. And I'll be honest, creating this structure out of seemingly nothing felt impossible. It felt like an impossible burden. God, how in the world are we supposed to get this congregation moving back together and serving again? Brian's message last week was that God is up to something. And like King David, when you pray for direction, God will answer you in very direct ways. This logo here, this may look like any other diagram or the next new idea that's going to be yesterday's old news, but we as leaders feel like this is precisely what God is up to. It is the culmination of about three months worth of work and dedication from multiple people. Allow me to take a moment to explain it, and I have some packets if you're interested that are in much more in depth and detail. But if you notice, there's three circles that all intersect, and then there's a middle core team. One circle is our youth. We want to teach them to serve through dedicating time with the elderly, through helping those in need within the congregation. We want to help serve in the community, and we even want to take some short-term mission trips. Our church used to do many things like this with our youth, did we not? We did. It's time to get back to work. Another circle, if you'll notice, is the community. This is divided into three subgroups. The cook team is number one. We want to do things like help feed the community. We want to continue to have fellowship dinners and feed our youth during events. And we want to have a special focus on appreciating our firefighters, our policemen, our teachers, and other organizations within the community through helping or through sharing baked goods, cookies, sweets, treats, and just say thank you and that we're here. Something that we're just beginning to process, we want to get into our school system. We have identified that we live in one of the poorer communities around. We have a higher poverty rate than usual. This area of outreach is taking shape, but it's still in the building process. And then service. We are working to identify light yard work for those in need, small repair jobs like a rotten deck board or an unsafe handrail, painting projects. These are things just to name a few. There are many ways this can take shape and we're still working on identifying those. But here's one thing that we're going to start doing. Every Monday night, starting in March, we're going to do a trial run. We're going to do a basketball ministry. We're going to open up to the community and those within from six to eight. And we're going to start using the Family Life Center again. I and Neil and a few others can't wait to kind of take this on. And there are those who are not part of the church who are ready to be a part of it. Bringing in the community to help give back is one of the key areas of that. If you come into the Lord's house, you share time with us, we want to help give back. That other large circle there represents the mission team. For years, this church has supported and sent homegrown missionaries. Dedicated people have overseen and continue to oversee this wonderful endeavor. But if we're being honest, many in the congregation have lost their heart for mission as only a handful of people, a handful, blah, 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 blah. So I'm sure that's what I sound like. Take two. Only a handful of people actually help support the missions. And I want to remind you of Jesus' words in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. 
And if you notice, in the middle, there is a core group at the heart of all this to help administrate events, but most importantly, to communicate all the wonderful things that we're doing for the kingdom with everyone who is unable to participate in the events. And I just, want to thank, I just want to take a minute and thank everybody who's been involved with the youth program, everybody who's been involved in the missions for so long. This core group and this team effort, it's not to take over, not to push out, not to say you've been doing anything wrong. It's to enhance. It's to share the stories, to help administrate events. We just want to partner and come alongside all of you. We want to tell the stories. You know, my, my overwhelmed feelings about all this are dissipating rapidly. God is bringing everyone together and moving hearts to serve. This was put in place, and then there was nobody put in place except for the existing youth and the existing missions, and nothing in the community and no core team, and I, I honestly questioned if we could do it. But the core team is in place. We have five, wonder, well, four wonderful people and then myself involved in the core team. You can amen to that too. <laughs> there you go. The main cook team of five eager servants was established that week, and they're all five different people. It's not the same people doing the same things. The greater cook team who will supplement with specific needs is growing and has room for more. We already have two cooking engagements. And I just want to say praise God for one minute again say it all day long. There were 31 places to fill on that helping hands ministry. The first thing that we have tried to come together and do on that kind of a scale in a long time for three weeks of signups, and this will be the fourth opportunity to sign up out of six, there were only seven places of 31 left. And I commend you guys for your servant hearts for stepping up to that call. We have a group of people willing to run errands and some even to give rides to those in need. A couple people are starting to try to identify our needs within the school system with some of our inside connections. Like I said, this basketball ministry is set to begin the first Monday in March with some new faces who don't even attend here ready to participate in it. Be a little honest, hearing numbers of over 100 people that used to come before is a little scary. I think it's going to spread like a fire once the word gets out. We're taking 10 junior high kids to Believe next weekend for the first time in several years. Jerry Van Meter's church, uh, not Jerry, uh, Jeff Van Meter's, Jerry's son, Jeff Van Meter's church is coming up with 10 kids and we're going to stay overnight out here. And then the other cook team engagement is, is they're going to provide the meals for us to do it. Let's amen to that one. That one's pretty cool. You got you to be honest. That's pretty cool. We get to share with other church kids. We get to go see hundreds, if not a thousand kids praising the Lord next weekend. A lot of you have already stepped up in this Helping Hands homeless dinner on the 12th. And I hope that more of you will feel the urge to finish out those seven places. A person felt the call to kids in our youth group personal Bibles geared towards their specific age over the coming year. I keep having people that are just emboldened and put on fire to come up to me each week. And it may not seem like that big of a deal to you, but I am excited about the coffee shop. I don't want anything to do with helping build it. This last edition was good enough for me. Thank you, Brian. I love you, buddy, more than ever. But some of you may have mixed emotions about it, but here's the deal. We're creating a warm and friendly atmosphere for new people to mingle with something that we already do. We already have coffee. We're just providing a warm atmosphere to share it with. A wonderful group of volunteers has stepped up to see this happen. And our elders are literally rolling their sleeves up and getting involved. Our youth has started to have worship on a regular basis. And Neil's working to start a praise band within the youth. Nurturing our musical talents for the Lord and helping the kids discover their God-given talents is it's a good thing. It's a great thing. Rob Mueller has been working hard to establish a Sunday school curriculum that engages our children and develops them in a biblical manner that coincides with our vision. We've been doing that for years, not discrediting that, but that, that all merges together. Several new people have wanted to step up and help teach as those opportunities arise. 
And many, many more things are in the mix. I literally feel like, even though I'm not wearing a tie today, I feel like God's grabbed a hold and is just dragging me along. And he's like, plug into there, plug into there, put that together, put that together. And we're just trying to make it happen. So if you're not already involved in something and you hear an opportunity, I meant what I said about plenty of opportunities are on the way. Well, now they're here and there are more to come. But all of this has happened so rapidly and it's all working itself out. But can you see that God is up to something? Are we the only ones? Do you guys feel it? Do you guys see it? Because we do. We're not the church of Laodicea, but we're always susceptible of falling victim and getting into that trap. Fortunately, we serve a loving God who rebukes us and calls us back into serving Him. Remember, he pays very close attention to our deeds. But I do want to be clear. It's not the deeds that gets us to heaven. We can do nothing to get to heaven. And that's going to be the topic of next week. But what we do is very important. Finally, I want to show all of you some of the wonderful things that I've been able to take in. As somebody who's a part of this, I get to sit back and see all the stuff happening. The Family Life Center is being used now a lot if we could show the pictures. This was dartball last Tuesday that we came along. I thought that things were starting to wane a little bit with the dartball, but there were th at least three people per team and we hadn't had that in a while that we'd been averaging two on four or five of the teams, but we had at least three, if not the full four on every team last Tuesday. The next picture, if you'll notice, we set up along the inside there and none of this was set up at one of our fellowship luncheons and guess what? We were just putting tables and chairs up. You underestimate what God can do and he'll show you. We were carrying chairs out from back here to set up for that. That looks like a pretty good time, doesn't it? The next time, or the next picture. All this was, <laughs> this was the men's, oh my, my hungry son that likes to eat all the time. Let's put him on the spot. All this was, was the dinner for the, for the men's versus women's. This was the ladies' practice. That's all that was. And you know what? I went and got two loaves of bread and lunch meat. And guess what I got? I waited to eat last and I got a heel. I had a heel of bread left. That was it. One heel. But praise God for that. Remember, when we hear the knock, Jesus is at the door. Will you let him into your heart by serving his church? Devoting yourself to it like so many have gone before us to make this place great? So to the question of how we got here, the title of this message, we got here on the backs of many people who serve this church and community. We like all things in a fallen world have had times of struggle. But right here, right now, we are poised to grow this church again to a place it used to be. The horizon looks promising, doesn't it? Isn't it time we step up and show everyone our servant hearts? Who knows, maybe we could even change somebody's eternal destination. And I want to take a minute and take myself. I've said a lot of eyes in this message, but it's not been about me. It's been about all of you. You guys are answering the call. And the last thing I want to share with you, that fateful day, that morning that God was preparing in my heart, something I didn't know, when I sat out there in the Family Life Center and I felt that emptiness and I realized what the church could be and could become, there was a deafening silence and I couldn't figure it out and I processed it over the months. And I really feel like it was the voice of all the people that helped create this place to what it is now, asking, where are they? Where is who? Where are all the people that this place was built for? You know what the beautiful thing is? Every time I go into the Family Life Center now, whether it's through events, Monday nights it's going to be used, Wednesday nights it's going to be used, Saturdays, Sundays, I'm hearing the voices of all of you and the people that are coming in. And we're moving in a very vibrant and healthy way. God's up to something. And we're on the... I just hope and pray that you'll continue to answer the call as the opportunity presents itself. Let's pray. 
Almighty God, I want to take a minute and I want to glorify your son, Jesus Christ. I want to elevate him over all the people that have been a part of this church. Our service and our acts are only because of the salvation that we've been given in you. The sacrifice that was paid on behalf of each and every one of us. We are to give our faith in you and then we are to give back to your kingdom on behalf of that faith. On behalf of that salvation. On behalf of that forgiveness. And I just pray, God, that your spirit continues to move us in a way that we can seek and save the lost all around us. And we do it through serving in your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.